so welcome to Former People's YouTube pod slash vodcast. Um, I'm Derek Varn, the co-editor of Former People, and I suppose we should introduce ourselves. I'll let my co-editor introduce himself first. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Mihalkov, uh, the other co-editor for Former People. Um, basically, uh, Derek and I started it a few months ago, um, met under previous political shared histories and uh, shared interests in aesthetics and decided fairly shortly thereon to introduce this uh, journal and a topic that we're particularly interested in. And then by day, I'm a management consultant, but it's not particularly interesting. Uh, yeah. I am a teacher and poet and who lives in Mexico and has lived in various places like South Korea, uh, the, the southern U.S., and I um, edit a lot of things, actually. Um, I'm the managing editor of The North Star, which is a political magazine. I am the sort of co-head blogger of this loyal opposition to modernity, which is a culture blog tied to this project. I have been the the um, managing editor of the Milkwood, uh, Milkwood Review. I've been an assistant editor at Arts and Letters, Journal of Contemporary Culture, and I've published um, poetry and interviews all over the place. Um, and places like Unlikely Stories 2.0, Writing Disorder, uh, Parini Fountain, and uh, um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's who we are, mm -hmm. um, as boring as that might sound. Mm -hmm. Reading CVs is always painful. You ever notice that? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, to a certain extent, uh, I have the, perhaps something of a cold attitude towards my own personality. It's like my personal narrative and background is only interesting to the effect to which I think it's applicable to what we do, and by and large, I, I think most of my past isn't necessarily applicable to this, so why bother? Fair enough. Um, so, to get to the more interesting part, what is Former People, what is the project, and why are we doing this? So, do you want to start with that, or do you want me to take a first stab? You can take a first stab. I mean, we talked about it a lot, and the, the thing that our listeners don't know is, um, in the last month... I've appeared on a podcast, and we both appeared on a podcast kind of explaining this, so we've had to actually kind of hash this out already. Exactly, and you can really look at it from a variety of perspectives uh, if you really wanted to. But um, I'd say, like, you know, starting with this whole idea, of at the very basic level, where does this whole concept of former people come from? So it, it certainly has a sort of political background to it, but also at least from my own perspective, a metaphorical background. And the political historical background, um, depending on how familiar you are with the period of the Russian Revolution, the Civil War, and its aftermath, the former people is the, for lack of a better term, code word used to describe uh, not only the aristocracy, but the remaining aristocracy of the Russian Empire after uh, World War I, after the, the Red Civil War, um, and their children, basically this whole idea that this component of the former uh, Russian Empire now sort of lingering on inside and arguably outside the Soviet Union would no longer have a place in the dialogue. They would no longer really be a part of this new epoch of the Soviet world. Uh, admittedly, you know, this idea that um, the period of history has changed and it's changed away from what the aristocracy represented and was and at least in my mind and Derek we can go back to you to get more into the specific details of the history but in my mind I think of it more along the lines of the metaphorical reference to what you and I sort of have as our attitude toward modernism I think at least from my perspective for a very long time particularly with the advent of postmodernism and whatever you might want to call the certain contexts we live in now, uh, at least from aesthetically speaking, um, modernism sort of represented something like that. There were a sort of represents an old epoch that had its time. Um, anxieties came about. Certain questions and concerns about that point of view 
were raised, and we sort of moved on away from them. And I think where we are now, maybe from your perspective or my perspective, we can, you know, think about this in a little bit more detail. But it seems that in the criticisms or concerns I would have of our contemporary setting, I think back to some of the things that would have been raised, you know, from the time of the modernists. And so, and particularly their point of view and how they would approach questions of aesthetics. But at the same time, I can't, as it were, resituate myself back in their time. So if anything, we have, you know, you know, a phrase, you know, we, I think we have some anxiety for, but there's no other ideal choice to have, you know, a, a concept of neo-modernism, which in my mind is sort of being influenced by the modernists, and yet at the same time recognizing our own place in time and how we can't necessarily be them. We can perhaps at best sort of echo uh, some of their past thoughts. So maybe that's a little bit of rambling, but Derek, why don't you uh, chime in on what you think? Yeah, I, I sort of pick up former people as as more, uh, you know, so metaphorically, but more in the spirit of what they were, which mostly in the case of the former people in the Soviet Union, they were the children of the aristocracy, not the aristocracy themselves. And they tried to get by um, as normal people, working class people, in the sense that they were rendered working class. Um and that the system that was trying to eradicate them had claims to have answered questions that were not really answered. And I sort of feel that way about postmodernism, contemporary literary fiction. And I think they're not the same, although their like hybridity over time increases. Um, I think postmodernism was a legitimate si- uh, series of questions that came out of the concerns of sort of high modernist aesthetics and the breaking down of of certain, you know, uh, ideas about distinction. And that these were legitimate questions. But over time, um, those sort of questions became very easily answered with flippant sort of answers that pretty much turn everything into pastiche and jokes. Um, And with a circular self-reference that doesn't ever get outside of itself. Um, I want to return to the older questions, you know, in my reading of Russian history, um, the more interesting people, you know, they're, some of them are these former people. Also, some of them are also the, looter, the losers in the great Bolshevik game. Uh, you know, the, some of the Mensheviks, some of the more interesting Bolsheviks who are also liquidated. And so the metaphor isn't really, you know, a, per, a perfect one, but it's definitely about trying to deal with the questions that come up in a period of transition, you know, socially and what that says aesthetically. Um, and because we're more concerned with questions than answers as far as what our aesthetic and philosophical criterion are, it sort of leads us to having a very open ended take on, um, you know, what we are calling neo modernism, which is. Neo-modernism is a way of, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an awkward nihilism in the same way that, that postmodernism is, but it's a way of saying, like, we are returning to a set of questions, but we realize that we are not doing the same thing, that doing the same thing would be essentially impossible now. Um, you know, the, there's no way the aristocracy was coming back after, not even the Russian Revolution, but even the first one, the, I mean, the first... The first Russian Revolution, much less the second. So, the red one. So, it's the same sort of deal. Um, and we're also interested in the sort of liminal states or lines between different genres, different periods, different aesthetic choices. Um, you know, uh, a lot of what we do will be based on just looking at Things like, what is the relationship between, say, genre fiction and high avant-garde fiction? What is the relationship between um, different kinds of modernism all over the world? Do they actually map out the same way? Can you actually compare the Chinese experience to, say, the Anglophone experience? Um, You know, and these aren't these aren't concerns that are outside of postmodernism historically, but postmodernism just sort of collapses the distinctions down and you know posits those meta narratives as arbitrary. And we're sort of saying no, they're not arbitrary; they're just different. And you kind of have to 
look at them in different ways. I mean, you know, we can go into our influences in a second, but but I think those are essentially, you know, interesting concerns. And I, I think that may be a difference between you and I, Stephen, is that we actually do have different answers to how we break down aesthetic differences and what's going on in the world of literature right now. And I think, you know, not to call you out or anything, but you are more in a pre-1980 world. So, Well, I've admitted that uh, almost directly in, in certain discussions we've had. Uh, so uh, even though I, I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, this is 100% the case, one example I have uh, sometimes given is that I generally tend not to read authors who haven't already been writing books or articles or what have you before 1980. And I think you're right to point that out, but I don't also necessarily think it's a sum total of, of everything. But I think this is a good discussion that you and I don't necessarily have 100% agreement on what aesthetics means, but I think by and large, you and I, at the end of the day, see a fair amount of things eye to eye. And I think perhaps that's another good reason as to why I think if you were to ask us, well, what are the aesthetic criteria of the, of the journal? What, you know, do we have a specific theory? I, I think you'll find that we pr- almost proactively don't do that. And I think even if we don't do that, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, what we put out, what we're interested in, what we produce is incoherent. No, we're not. We're not saying that. I mean, the one thing we definitely aren't interested in, in is a pastiche of modernism. We don't, we're not interested in recreating to it. We're not even really interested in truly returning to it and, you know, in the way of like trying to re- bring about modernist literary movements. That would be foolish, I think, and fundamentally foolish even. Um, and so what that leaves us with is trying to explore what we saw were the key distilled questions of the various authors that we're interested in. Um, looking at how they play out in contemporary literature and and what that says, if there is a coherent set of movements there. Um, you know, a lot of times there's a sort of disjointed feel to what we do in the sense that, you know, I, if you look at, the, say, the first two issues, which have already been published, you will see, for example, a lot of found poetry, which is something that you and I are sort of both actually sort of almost ambivalent to, but the, the poems we got were interesting. Um, a lot of sort of attempts at high modernism with slight political commentary. And then what a lot of people would read as sort of experimental genre fiction, such as Joel Pulver's work, which we published, as well as Douglas Lane's work, um, both of which flirt with various genres, Pulver with weird fiction and horror fiction, and Lane with science fiction and um, sort of bizarro fantasy, but neither entirely encapsulates that because they also use literary elements that would be considered explicitly modernist. Um, references to, to music, um, stream of consciousness, breakdowns, um, metafictive techniques, etc., that you don't normally associate with most genre fiction. Although I'm increasingly finding if you read good genre fiction, it's there already. It's just not often discussed about outside of those circles. Um, but, but we're also interested in more straight-ahead traditional you know, literary fiction that you know, does not automatically jump to what we can see as the kind of, you know, aesthetic judgment that you see in The New Yorker, which is sort of like wry, almost postmodern realism, with the attitude of postmodernism, but the style of Hemingway or of Amy Hempel or of Laurie Moore. Um, And, you know, I love all the three of those authors, but people that are highly derivative of that... There's just a certain blandness of tone that comes from the fact that the questions they answer, well, they're really not questions. They're not positing questions. They're more interested in concern, you know, constructing really clear sentences sometimes um, and being sort of self-referential. 
which is painful. I mean, it's painful to read, I think, and it's um, and it reflects a certain cultural myopia, um, yeah. which I would almost say is particular to the United States. But you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm actually very glad you brought up this whole question of like where you know our interests somehow being in these sort of borderland authors and texts and you know like we enjoy you know objects that come from genre fiction as much as we might enjoy something which would have came from the realm of i, I guess you might call pure high literature academic literature whatever you want to ultimately label it and i think what's an interesting phenomenon which at least from my perspective seems to be happening now is that i think what you and i may be most concerned about is um i think you know i've heard it uh described i think you know what's the difference between you know if you limit yourself just to genre fiction so like what's the difference between genre fiction that i would argue is good or perhaps you know maybe more less aggressively say that you and i like versus just your run-of-the-mill genre text and i think you know there has to be something to do with how you fetishize the genre itself are you interested in mostly fulfilling what the genre, you know, sort of demands of it. So if you write, you know, let's say a hard boiled detective story, you know, you, you know, and you're interested in just paying off on what the genre demands, you know, you're going to do, you know, three or four different types of things. You're going to have a Philip Marlowe style detective. You're going to have, uh, you know, a sort of femme fatale type, uh, woman, you know, X, Y, and Z. And I think what's, interesting now is that even the quote-unquote literary fiction is in its own way a type of genre fiction in which the literature itself seems more focused on hitting like the four or five things you have to do in order to make yourself literary fiction and none of which seems to be like you know to, you know, to the point you raise like at you know raising interesting questions or even uh you, you don't necessarily answer the questions but at least you know pausing that the questions are important as opposed to i, I think you've described it as doing little more than you know, fulfilling whatever basic sort of types of sentence constructions you're looking for. And um, if you want to get into a little bit of the influences, I think one of the influences that you and I share, who I think really drives at this point, is J.G. Ballard. So, you know, J Ballard's history definitely starts, I think, probably in an easily identifiable way in genre fiction. But even from his earliest books, you, you know, he is doing a lot more than just satisfying the genre. Um, so, you know, the uh, forgive me if I you know, miss the you know, the titles uh, ever so slightly. You know, the Crystal World or the Drowned World. Not only these, you know, he had a whole series of like Earth, you know, being destroyed in whatever number of different types of ways you can conceive. But, you know, they, these texts aren't particularly just interested in fulfilling the requirements of the genre. He's always doing more, and he, it, to the point where you get to books like, you know, The Atrocity Exhibition, or Crash, or even his autobiography, he's no longer really encapsulated in one specific space. And to me, and I, you know, Derek, I'll give you a chance to, to chime in on this, that I think maybe in a sort of by example is sort of like, what you and I are most often looking for these days and what we hope maybe former people, you know, is somewhat trying to provide a space for. Yeah. I'm very interested in a lot of people actually of that generation of sci-fi writers who I think are very much in the aesthetic criterion that we're looking at. Um, uh, Thomas Ditch, who's also a poet, um, who wrote, you know, many great sort of psychological sci-fi novels in the seventies. Uh, Sam Delaney, who is, who is, uh, you know, a very good writer of color and of, of, of queerness in a way, but is also very disconcerting and sort of eschewing those simple identi identitarian concerns and his hard sci-fi and being artistically motivated. I mean, when you read his work, you, you realize that, yeah, Alfred Besser and, and a lot of the old sci-fi guys are leaning in the background, but also so is Nabokov and, uh, you know, Gertrude Stein. Um, yeah, I, there are, there, we live in an interesting time right now where there are, you know, some mainstream literary authors who would be very popular and critically successful who are interested in this. Um, you know, the bigger ones would be like Paul Oster, uh, Margaret Atwood, who I really respect, 
um, Michael Chabon, but, but at least in the case of Chabon, you still have a lot of that slight flippancy or, you know, unwillingness to be entirely serious. And sometimes the celebration of genre there is almost as a way to sort of hollow out the expectations, uh, as opposed to, say, when you look at someone who's writing weird fiction now, like, say, Layard Barron or um, uh, Nathan Bullegrun, who uh, in the uh, issue three I actually will be talking about in a long essay on three different collections of short stories, where they actually sort of use genre as just a way to explore themes of traditional tragedy um, and of human helplessness and of a world that seems very, very inhuman. Um, And with a weight that actually you're not really allowed in in a lot of literary fiction to approach as anything other than satire. I mean, you know, one of my favorite contemporary authors right now is George Saunders, who I think is brilliant, but I think his work is afflicted by the fact that to be sentimental, to be allowed to be sentimental and still be popular, he must write really bitter satire. Um, and he cannot let his, tra- his tragedy linger. He almost must play the laughing clown because that is a role, I mean, the laughing crying clown. Because that is a role that is acceptable in our current literary milieu that genre fiction writers actually don't have to be as concerned about. Um, Which, in a way, gives them some freedom that when you're ticking off boxes on, you know, what would be a good MFA acceptable short story? And I say this as a person who has an MFA in poetry and really thinks I've benefited from it. Um, You can't do. Um, Or you can't do easily. And conversely, former people exist because while there are certain established authors that get away with being so slipstream, you know, um, and while there are genres that sort of revel in it, there is actually no real place that that seems to be willing to put all this together as a sort of collective project where we're not trying to create another small micro niche of literature. Like I'm not trying to create the slipstream weird tell journal. I'm trying to put these things back into conversation with say avant-garde poetry, um, with, uh, with scholars of modernism, with scholars of postmodernism. I mean, the one thing we haven't talked about is theoretically we are open to scholarship at former people. It's part of our mission. Um, We haven't had a lot of submissions in there, but it's part of the mission because it's, our goal is to put all this back into conversation in a way that I think it really was in conversation in say 1920, where you had the salons and you had these professors and writers and, and all that really in dialogue with each other because the university was not the kind of institution that could be so separate from the culture, ironically, given our, our, our opinion of you know, early 20th century universities, is actually was not the case. They were not funded the way they are now until after, the, after World War II. And um, also, there wasn't the strong separation between popular and avant-garde artists. Again, we seem to think of that as not the case. But I think the separation that we see in that is almost a function of the way things are marketed, not a function of the way things are actually produced. So, you know, the honest reader might like a really avant-garde writer like, say, David Markson or, uh, you know, or whoever, um, but would still enjoy, you know, a good short story even by someone as, you know, pedestrian as Stephen King. You know, I'm definitely that kind of person. Um... Now, that's not to say that I actually buy the whole collapse of high and low literature that one sees in postmodernism, which, ironically, I don't think the postmodernists really realized would sort of come out in this wash of Hmm. mid-cult, you know, to make a a reference to that that famous book, you know, High Cult, Low Cult, Mid-Cult. I'm trying to remember if the, the the Marxist turned liberal literary critic who wrote it, but... You know, came out of a partisan review essay. 
It's been republished by uh, New Yorker Books, I think. But anyway, um, you know what I'm talking about, though. Yes, the concept, yes. So, I mean, like, when you write someone who, you know, who I think is more exemplary of the current literary set guys like Dave Eggers, you know, which is sort of like the everyman's David Foster Wallace, which in being the everyman's David Foster Wallace takes everything redeemable about David Foster Wallace out of it. Um, And so you have the irony and the wry wit of postmodernism sort of hybridized with middle brow literature and it doesn't, and like, actually, in this weird way, the virtues of both are sort of lost. Like, when I talk about the flippancy of postmodernism, I'm actually not referring to, to authors or poets like, say, uh, the late Beats, the language poets, or uh, even someone like uh, William Gaddis, you know, um, or even David Foster Wallace, who we've talked a lot about on other on another podcast, so I'm not going to do that much on our own. Um, whereas, uh, if you look at someone like uh, Eggers, it just doesn't seem to go anywhere. It's too self-referential and too concerned with identity, and it's really sort of problematic way. And I think you also see that in Jonathan Franzen um, and a lot of these authors that have pretenses to being, like, high literary authors. You know, they'll get pissed off if you give them the Oprah Book Award, for example, to bring that decades-old controversy up. Um, But they're not really writing anything that's actually particularly all that innovative. Interestingly enough, have you read Freedom? Yes, and I beat my head against the wall with it. What do you think of Freedom? So it's, I actually, the thing I found most annoying with it, and probably the the piece of the text that I found the most difficult reading and thus you know, almost forced me to give up on the whole book was that big section where uh, Jonathan Franzen is trying to write as uh, basically a um, middle-class white suburban woman, uh, you know, who through her I th- uh, psychoanalytical process is trying to write a sort of autobiographical narrative. And, you know, this woman, you know, according to friends and is supposed to be not very intellectual, you know, so more of like a sporty, you know, type woman, you know, in writing. And I don't ever get the sense that that is the type of person I'm reading. All I ever get the sense is that Jonathan Franzen is writing as if he might be a woman, but it's Jonathan Franzen. And again, it, it, this is something that I think you and I have touched on before, definitely with, uh, in uh, David Foster Wallace, but a lot more sympathetically. It's like there is this strange tendency to, you know, again, not just get tied up in identity politics, but to get tied up in the self in such a way that you're just so never going to escape it. And to my mind, like, Franzen never gets out of himself. And frankly, his self is not that interesting. Right. I think, um, you know, you see it in the corrections, too. Um, and I think genre fiction and the, you know, we seem to be harping on that, and maybe that's good because our, our third issue was sort of actually an homage for a particular genre. Um, is does give you a way to distance yourself, you know? And we've talked about this in other form in other forms too. That one of the things that we respect about the early modernists, particularly Pound, Eliot, Wallace Stevens, and even William Carlos Williams in a weird way, is how is how much of their personality is actually bracketed out of their work. Um, like, systemat- I mean, there's still a lingering trace, of course, but it's systematically bracketed out. Um, you know, you can't assume that any of the narrators in an Eliot poem uh, or even a William Carlos William poem actually represent themselves exactly. Mm-hmm. And um, that's the, almost the opposite of the trend in literature right now. Um, and what's funny is you're not even really allowed a clean, uncomplicated identity politics either, like, because that would be too serious in a way. You know, it's interesting. Um, in the famous, uh, essay, I'm fairly convinced it was probably a lecture at one point that Nabokov gives on, you know, good readers and good writers. You know, he gives his students an exercise like, you know, identifying what does it take to be, you know, to for a book to be good or for you to be a good reader, what have you. And invariably, like, one of the things that the students really came to was uh, this idea of, like, I need a character I can identify with. And in a way, you know, 
it's funny, you know, I mean, Nabokov clearly mocks that in a variety of ways, not the very least of which in his own fiction. Um, but, you know, this whole notion that, you know, oh, you know, I, I need, you know, good, you know, someone to root for, as it were. It's, in a way, you know, we can th- laugh it off as like, oh, that's just something, you know, we, you know, you laugh off and you see in sort of like fripperies or penny dreadfuls or what have you. But the thing is, that whole idea is just repackaged in a lot of the contemporary fiction. Uh, you know, again, it's like, you know, either, if, you know, Franzen or whomever you, else you want to put in. It's almost as if, like, I'm so obsessed with myself, please like me. <laughs> and it, right. it's, and it's just not interesting. I'll be, I'll be honest with you, even if, you know, even as the kind of person who comes from that demographic, I just don't care. <laughs> um, and I don't want to promote literature like that either, which is not to say I don't, I don't like literature of the self. I do. I just don't like literature of the self that is unquestioning of the self because it seems to get caught up in its own, you know, its own, uh, issues. And, um, you know, I think of former people, that's really what we're trying to push past. Now, we have our limitations to it. I mean, like, we're, we're more looking, trying to find things that ask particular questions. And we're also asking particular questions of authors, which is why we do interviews and whatnot as well. Um, you know, and you can see that in the first few, uh, the first few pieces that we've done. Um, but I think in the next couple of issues where we, where, since we now have more, you know, people know who we are, we've gotten two issues under our belt, and so they know that their, their stuff is actually going to get published if accepted, for example, we, we'll be able to go into more the- thematic questions and really ask these things. Um, so, you know, to go into our own policy, we always have a general slush pile. And we'll always, you know, consider general flesh offer issues. It's not going to always, it's never going to be like, this is the poetry issue with, with uh, people, with Indian American poets born from 1980 to 1995. Mm-hmm. Um, we're never going to do that. Uh, a lot of journals do do that. I, f- I find that tedious. Um, but what we are going to do is try to have, you know, a, a half to a fourth of an of a, a issue dedicated to some central questions, at least every other issue. So this month we have the weird as the new modern, the weird tale as the new modern. Um, I foresee us also doing something on eventually on 70s science fiction as a success of the modernism. Um, and so like those issues are going to be very, very real. Um, and we're going to really try to push that out, you know, as an answer to a lot of these things that we see as sort of bothering trends in literary publication. Um, and we're also doing that. The other reason why we do that with the general slush pile is that we're also trying to put, like I said earlier, we're trying to put these things in dialogue with one another. So, like, if I'm publishing only weird fiction, I'm on, I don't publish any of my modernism from around the world interviews or any of the you know, anything that you want to about book reviews or whatever, even if they're not exactly thematically related, then we're not really putting anything in dialogue with one another. We're just, like, serving up a niche every every issue. And I don't really have, you know, while that may be a, a, a smart publishing strategy for a little while, I, I don't know if it would be for a long while because it would be very hard to keep that up. But um, don't you don't you think that, you know, that's sort of one of the things we hope to make us distinctive, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, again, to really go back to this idea of, um, you know, like running up against the, you know, the edges or, you know, finding pe- things that are not 100% easily cate- you know, categorized, you're right. I mean, it would be something like an empty marketing ploy if all we did was like, you know, this month will be weird fiction, next month will be, like you said, Indian poets, the month after that, it's like modernism in the age of the iPhone or some stupid nonsense like that. It gets boring after a while. And it it misses our fundamental point again, which is like, you know, there is going to be, you know, a, sen- and it's a sense and an attempt to situate these things in a broader context. So uh, even in our, you know, section on, you know, like weird as the, you know, Weird as the new modern. Even in my, you know, you know, interview we're going to have with S.T. Joshi, I think a lot of the questions, although focusing on you know, weird fiction, is really attempting, you know, to broach it from the perspective of okay, where does weird fiction fit within this, you know, broader, you know, setting of modernism? Where, 
you know, what are the anxieties that sort of spawned it, you know, weird fiction, and what do those anxieties relate to in terms of modernism, but also even in contemporary weird fiction, again, it's trying to, you know, we're going to ask the same questions, where does weird fiction, what are the anxieties of contemporary weird fiction, what, are that, what does that mean for anxieties we would generally have expressed for, let's say, postmodernism, which we have been talking about uh, in this in this podcast, and, and again, it just seems to me, and I think Derek, you would agree that, like, if we just are going to fetishize genre, we're just falling back into the uh, the subject of our own critique. Yes, uh, I I think that's very much the point. So let's move on about a few talk about a few other things that we're doing. Um, you know. Right now, we're going to have an ongoing interview series on world modernism. I don't know how long, how many issues we're going to do, but we started it off with a with an interview on Chilean and Latin American modernist poetry. And in the coming month, we're going to have an interview with Locus Klein, who's a scholar on Chinese literature on modernism in, in modern China. Um, and then we'll have probably... Uh, an issue four, an interview on uh, contemporary Indian, like subcontinent Indian literature, um, and uh, and we'll see where it goes from there. Um, but I, I personally am very interested in, in rethinking and recategorizing the way we think of world literature, not you know, not in terms of. Of you know, there's a lot of you know debate about unitary modernism versus mini modernisms and and all that. Um, I'm not as interested in those questions. Um, I tend to view things as parallel but not exactly the same. Um, and uh, I sort of wonder you know like if the questions of say neo modernism are even applicable to a literary you know place like. China, I suspect they are, um, but uh, we will have to look into that more, and that's part of what our mission is to do. Um, you know, like I said, we don't have a theoretically hard program. We don't have a rigid definition of aesthetics. We don't even have a rigid definition of neo-modernism. Um, a couple of things that could be clarified, I guess. Uh, former people is tied to another project of mine that's actually much older called the disloyal opposition to modernity, which was originally called the loyal opposition to modernity and slightly slipped over times as I became less of a programmatic Marxist, which explores the tensions of trying to deal with, you know, life after philosophical and historical modernity, which is actually because of the way that the modern has been appropriated, not contiguous with literary modernity. In fact, I would argue that like philosophical modernity is way over before like literary modernity even exists. But you're still dealing with you know world produced out of that. And so I am very interested in in the tensions of of modern life. And I don't have hard answers for any of those questions. Um, I don't have it philosophically and culturally, which is what this loyal blog is about, our sister site. And I don't have it aesthetically, which is what our scholarly, which is what our you know, magazine project is about. Um, but it is all tied together. And it'll be interesting to see what sorts of writers come to us in the future. We've already mentioned um, a few who we know are going to be there, but we, we still haven't finished compiling issue three, um, which, unlike our first two issues, will not be rolling. It will come out all at once. So at the end of October, instead of you know getting one poem and a, an essay every three days to a week and a half, um, we're just going to release like 10 to 15 things all at once, just like a proper magazine. Exactly, exactly. And I think that also is just going to help us, again, it'll help us with a number of things, uh, you know, uh, sort of logistically. But I think more importantly, 
again, like the whole idea of what you and I have been thinking about recently, which is, you know, trying to, you know, to the extent we think it's appropriate and possible, have these ideas of, um, question, you know, sort of like thematic questions that'll hit, uh, more than just one particular piece in the issue. And I think, you know, this will just help us uh, better f uh, be able to drive that down. And, um, and yeah, and obviously, I, as you gathered, like this, you know, this coming issue uh, will be on uh, weird as the new modern. Um, but it's not going to, as we said before, it won't exclusively be the case. And obviously, to the extent to which people are still interested in submis submitting material to us, please do so. We will uh, encounter it as we encounter all new material and give it the best of its uh, best of our attention. Yes, um, to our two potential writers. Our submissions slash pile never shuts off, which is maybe unfortunate for us in our lives. Um, what, what happens with us is if you want to be in a specific issue, particularly if it's a themed issue, and we will try to in the future, like we did this month, to post out, you know, outside of the publishing schedule on our EMAG when, when and what a themed issue is going to be once we've made a decision. And generally give everyone a about a month to a month and a half in the future to to get anything up. Um, we will be um, we will be reading, however, for the general slush pile constantly. Um, it may t you know depending on the time of year, it may take us longer to get back to an author. Like right now, we get back pretty fast. I mean, almost ridiculously fast. You know, if we get really bogged down, it could be up to two or three months. Um, which is actually standard for the publishing, literary publishing world. I sort of find that obnoxious in the age of the internet. But, you know, when you have a lot of submissions, which we're slowly beginning to, although it is slow, um, sometimes it does take a while to, to really treat everything fairly. But we will read it and we will accept it, you know, all times of the year. If it comes in a holiday or something, just don't expect. Yeah, our our notes, acceptances, our rejections, particularly quickly. Right, exactly, and I think uh, the I think you know the other thing to keep in mind is that, again with the degree to which we're quick to respond. Uh, I, I think the fact that you and I are both you know fully fully employed full time outside of this project, I think we do fairly well for ourselves on that front. Uh, but again, yeah. And, yeah, by fully employed, we mean like have full time jobs and other projects and 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 I mean. You and I both work more than 40 hours a week, and I edit stuff in addition to that. So it's sometimes I'm, I am, not to toot my own horn, but amazed that we get this done as fast as we do. Um, but we will um, be doing that. How many issues are we aiming for a year, Stephen? Um. I think at this current uh, rate of production, I think at least for the first year, I think we're going to try for tw 11 or 12, uh, just based on how our first two issues went. I think uh, a two-month period got collapsed into one. But I think uh, let's start – we're thinking about starting with a rate of approximately one a month. We'll see how that goes. Maybe, you know, we adjust. I would say one a month with exceptions for maybe holiday seasons. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so, so, for example, um, we might do – like a bigger issue for the summer, but not do a, not do two releases. Um, so, you know, and we will accept a probably, I mean, the one thing good about being an e-magazine is we can, we can pretty much accept as much as we want. Um, <laughs> so the criterion is aesthetic, not page limit, but we will probably accept, you know, between say, 12 and 30 pieces for an issue if we have good enough um, submissions. If we don't, then it might be five pieces. I mean, we're not a print magazine. We do, we do what we do what we need to do. Um, and we can discuss a few plans for our future. In the long run, knock on wood, um, former people will become a small print on demand press as well, doing a yearly anthology of our. Uh, of all the original work, unique to former people, we'll pick the best of it, you know, and do a brief uh, print on demand slash ebook anthology, um, and 
and maybe even a chapbook press for for short stories, novellas, and poetry. But yeah, um, that's in, you know we're looking at years in the future for that. You know, I'm only stating this in public now so that we can actually start like slowly holding ourselves accountable for it. <laughs> exactly. We we are finding mechanisms which we can use to keep ourselves honest. Yeah. Um, you know, and the other thing is we're gonna do if we're gonna do that. I'll be honest with you, we're not poor people, but we're we're artists in our part time. So, you know, f- presses like this would have to be operated on a we have the money slash it is affordable for us to do basis. <laughs> yes. Um, although I have to admit, new technologies, while it may make it harder to get work out, does make it cheaper to get work out. So. This is a real possibility. Twenty years ago, you and I would have to have uh, a real studio to be doing this right now, a real press to be doing our magazine, and unbelievable amounts of overhead to even talk about anthologies of a magazine. Um, so, you know, that's one of the good things about the otherwise problematic publishing technologies of our time. Mm-hmm. It, it, admittedly, and obviously, we could go into this at a later issue since it could be a long conversation. Everything is a sort of double-edged sword in a way. It's like with the ease of publication comes, you know, the you know the greater the volume and then the greater of things one has to wade through. We'll, we'll obviously most likely talk about that at some point in the near future. Well, yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about shop anyway, but th- that is a real concern for any print. And I think that is why one sees more literary journals existing now, because there's almost no overhead to do it other than your own time, which can be extensive, I will say that. Hmm. But why you see them fold so much, too, is it's very hard um, to exist except in a niche form. So I guess the last thing that we would like to talk about to our readers is maybe the, the risk that we're taking. Which, luckily for us, is not financial. <laughs> exactly. But, but the risk is that, you know, that we're developing something that, that may not have a huge amount of readers. Now, it doesn't need a huge amount of readers. Um, you and I aren't doing this to be, like, famous independent publishers. Um, if we were, we were going about this the exact wrong way. Um, but we will need the support. And we're not even talking, you know, fiscal support. We're not talking about money. We'll need people to really push our mission and what we do to get it out to the right readers and writers. You know, we exist for the readers and writers and for the ideas. We don't exist, you know, for any other reason. But we need those readers and writers to help push these ideas out there. Otherwise, you know, we have readers, we have a fair amount, actually, more than, say, the average zine does back in the 90s when this is how you would have started such a project. But we, you know, we'll need a lot more help to get a lot more out there because it's not, you know, a lot of what we're doing doesn't fit into an easy genre. It's not easy to market. Right. I, I think one way I, I would phrase it, and I think you, you've sort of, you've already alluded to it, um, again, is this idea that Again, to the extent if we're not focused on money and fame, what are we focused on? Well, and, and you rightly say it's the ideas. But, it, you know, at a certain level, like Derek and I can just as easily talk to each other about this on our own. Um, we can find, you know, examples of certain types of fiction that we will, you know, that we would enjoy and on that level and discuss it. But I think the point that, uh, you know, that we are engaging with, and the reason we do form our people, is that we think that there is something to this which is above and beyond ourselves. We think that there are definite, there is definitely, call it an interest, could be more extreme, call it an anxiety. You know, this subject and this sort of concerns that these concerns that we have can be very you know, are sort of bubbling up in the zeitgeist, for lack of a better term, to use very bad language. Um, yeah. But and I think you know, the, to the extent to which this can yield something fruitful in the sort of, for lack of a better term, culture at large, it's going to need uh, increased participation. 
And to the degree to which you as a reader enjoy this and you are comfortable with it and you really want to share this with people, there's no reason you shouldn't do that. Um, right. So if, if you, it, you know, and this could take so many forms. It could just be as simple as just telling friends, hey, you know, there's an interesting thing up here. Let's talk about it. Uh, it could be something a little bit more extensive. And, you know, let's say you post it on a wall, you, you talk about it in something of a more formal setting. Or it could be even to the extreme of actually participating in the project by submitting work or, you know, so on and so forth. Um, we still have open comments for now. Yes. <laughs> Which we're one of the few literary magazines that do. Um, and I'm not going to promise it's going to stay that way. We'll see. Because I will say that sometimes reading the comments on anything makes me sort of really doubt the, 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 you know, the foreseeability of human intelligence. But, but uh, you know, some comment sections are, are brilliant. And, and you can participate that way as well. What we want... It's just, if you're interested in this, if you like what we publish, if you like who we publish, share it. You know, at, at this point in the game, we need that more than we need money. And so we invite you all to participate in sharing and contributing as much as you want. We, we're here, you know, we're not doing this, we're not doing this not for ourselves. Like, I'm not going to put this in that. It's all for you. But we're not doing this primarily for ourselves because it, it would be just as easy for us to just talk about it ourselves and you know, not worry about keeping up a WordPress and a podcast and going on other podcasts and trying to find authors and doing interviews and lots of time-consuming things. Exactly, and I, I think that you know that again, it's to the degree to which um, it, you know it reminds me again of the the notion of the art that we like. Again, uh, we're not or at least we try not to be self or self uh, the, the Ultimately, the goal of this project is not a reaffirmation of the self, but the sort of, you know, the exploration of something which is, you know, perhaps beyond the self. And I think, you know, this call to, you know, sharing the project be up above and beyond the two of us and, you know, to really foster, you know, this so-called uh, community involvement is in many ways a, a manifestation of a lot of our aesthetics. So, you can confirm your your dedication to such things by uh, acting on the aesthetics that you uh, presumably also share with us. Right. And with that note, we'd like to just conclude about what this podcast is for. So this month was sort of an introduction to us and our project. That a little bit of sniping at some very popular authors, but in general, more focusing on what the magazine is going to do. In future months, we're going to be commenting on essays and pieces within the magazine itself, as well as trying to put them in dialogue with things outside of the magazine, whatever the current literary trends are, as best as we know them. Um, now, you know, if you don't know me, I'm already on a podcast about politics, and I'm also very busy. Um, I teach, I write for several blogs, I edit for several blogs. I actually don't know when I sleep. But we, we think that this will be important and um, that, that it will be something to do. I sort of got this idea, actually, from the Poetry Magazine podcast that does the same thing, where the editors discuss what they put in, and you really get insight into what the editors are trying to do. Um, and we hope that, too, will help our readers. And we hope they enjoy it and, and, and learn from it, and that we can learn from you and your interaction with us here. And I think we'd like to end on that note. So with that in right. mind, uh, everyone, thank you very much for listening to this first um, vidcast or audio cast or YouTube cast or whatever we ultimately decide on naming this particular uh, object on our magazine. And thank you very much for your attention and hope, you, hope to see you in our pages and around our pages. <laughs>